Hello, everyone, the whole world. Our guest today is Carrie Augenstein, and she's a fractional CFO, and she's super accomplished. So we are very happy to have her as our guest and learn all about her exciting world. Thanks, Sammy. Thank nice you for, to say. Thank you for, Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, Carrie, how's your day going? What, what do you do? What are you working on today? My day is going great. Today, or in general these days, we're wrapping up year end. So, mm -hmm. we're working on audits, finalizing schedules for tax accountants, and looking at the year in reflection. Now that we have like the finalized year end numbers, a lot of times you just take a pause, see how it see the performance, see how it compares to prior years. So I'm working with my clients on those activities. Wow. So it's a busy day. They're busy times, but they're fun times because you really can, you know, that's when you can really make strategic decisions for the future. Hmm. Wow. Like, can you give an example of a strategic decision? Sure. It might be you see the performance of different business lines and what's more profitable than some are more profitable or some products are becoming more profitable than others. And you analyze why that is the case. And it could be for a variety of reasons. And then you might try to either draw back on some of the less performing lines of business or products and accelerate on the more higher performing ones. Or you might want to try to mirror some of the successes that you're having on your higher performers and, and um, transition those to the lower performers if possible. Wow. So there's a lot of analysis that happens after the tax season, I would assume, right? Yeah, I think there's analysis happening all the time, really. You know, data has... The CFO role has really, and the accounting and finance role has really incorporated the importance of data, you know, especially as our systems have gotten more sophisticated. Wow. Yeah. So do you, were you always a CFO or like, how did you get introduced into your corporate world or what was your first job? Yeah. So it's interesting. I was actually, when I, I started working when I was about 14, 15 years old, I worked for uh, Guest Jeans in the times of Claudia Schiffer and Anna Nicole Smith when they were really huge. And I helped them open stores in Los Angeles. And I was a salesperson. So learning about customer service, merchandising, product development. And I worked for them all through high school and my first couple of years of college. So for quite a, some time. And when I decided to pick a major, I was like, the only part of business or the only part of that world I felt I didn't know was the accounting finance. So I decided to major in accounting and finance. And when you start on that trajectory, you know, you're encouraged to get your CPA license, which I did. And then the big firms come and recruit at the universities. And so at the time, I Coopers and Libran, before it merged, recruited me into their firm and I interned for them and then they merged with Price Waterhouse. And when I decided I didn't really like public accounting, I merged my experience, I guess, with my accounting finance background. And I reached out to the CFO at the time at BCBG and asked if they had a role for me. And they created a retail controller role for me. And so I got to really incorporate both aspects of my background. And then it's just kind of been going since then, working with different premium brands, being a controller for a long time. I had a fractional practice before fractional was a coined term back in 2010 to 2018. And then I went back in-house, became a CFO, and then decided to become, open up my fractional practice again. Wow. That's awesome. Were you a good, look, seems like you're a good student. You had a smooth life. You know, you're a high achiever from, from the early days. Uh, you know, it was interesting. I didn't ever care about school. And so I never really was a high performer. And when I got to college, I was like, well, I know I can be. I just have never really focused on it or made it a priority. And so I did. And it, I think it paid off in the long time. 
the long run. But until college, I really was not that invested. <laughs> Where did you go to college? Like, how, how was college life for you? Good. I started at San Diego State. They have a great business program there. But it was really hard to balance the scholastic with the social aspects. And so, again, thankfully, I did really well. And I was able to transfer to UC Santa Barbara, which also has a great business economics program, and they have an emphasis in accounting. And my sister was going to grad school there at the time. So I lived with her downtown. So it was really kind of more mellow my last few years of college. Wow, that's awesome. Going to college in Santa Barbara and San Diego, both beautiful. <laughs> by the beach. Yes, that's true. So <clears throat> so okay. you've had so many different jobs, right? And you like you mentioned your experience at Gap helped you with your next job, like guest genes. So like, what is like a commonality uh, that you've picked up through all these different experiences? You could also talk about mistakes that you've made and learn from them, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the com one of the commonalities is that, you know, processes and procedures are always important to have in place. And protecting the integrity of the data so your end result is accurate, right, is really super important. And, and also just the fact that you work with people, right? And, and you want to create positive environments for your teams so people enjoy coming to work, bring their best self, feel valued. And I think that that has been a huge priority and passion of mine to build positive team environments. And an early lesson, I have learned a few lessons along the way. And an early lesson was don't ever compromise your own values for a job. Wow. So if you're put in a position where you're going to have to compromise who you are as a person, no job is worth that. And so you will find the right fit for you. And don't be afraid to say no to something that you're not comfortable with. And I was fortunate enough to learn that in the early stages. And then in the later stages, what I've been, what I've learned and been applying is really like start doing that intuition. When I'm looking at reports and data, and sometimes it's a report that's existed for decades at a company and I see something that's a little off and it's just like this little ping you get and you have to it's a muscle you have to build to listen to it nine out of ten times there's something wrong something deep maybe it's a calculation maybe it's the data is not you know getting entered correctly and one out of ten times it's maybe an insight that I need to learn more about the business but there's often at the beginning when that started happening, there were times where you're, you know, you have deadlines and you're in a hurry. So you just are like, oh, you hear something, but you just kind of keep going. And then it always came back. And I just have really worked in the past, maybe five, 10 years to really listen to when you, and take a pause when you hear that, because it's, it, there's going to be something good underneath. Wow. It seems to me like a CFO is a very powerful and influential person in an organization. And sometimes you have to take ethical decisions as well. Uh, I don't know. I'm just speculating. But like, yeah, how does like that CFO fit into the whole organization structure? I think that's a good question because it's interesting as a CFO or even as like, a, let's say you're VP of be VP financial controller and you're the highest level accounting person at an organization. I've always felt to do the best job I could do is you really have to look at the business holistically. You can't just be in your little finance and accounting bubble in the corner. It's, you know, oftentimes you're relying on salespeople to enter in sales data or you're, you're relying on a customer service department to enter in data and you're relying on that data to make informed decisions. And so it's important to, I think, reach out, build relationships with all departments, see how their processes are, see how it's affecting the end financial statements and impacting that. And then plus you get great insight on their challenges and 
you might learn something about the business that where they're getting frustrated because, you know, there's an inefficiency and you can help facilitate, you know, um, to create and implement a more efficient process. And I don't know, that feels really good when you're helping others just like be happier at work and make their jobs a little easier for them. That's awesome. Yeah. I can picture you as Carrie as the friendly CFO. Uh, <laughs> I try to be. Again, I think just like having a positive work environment and culture is really important and being approachable and everybody observes different things. And I think you have to really stay open to being and be receptive to everybody's insights and observations and you can't be everywhere all the time. So hopefully you can learn something from everybody. Do you have like, and I have two questions. One is like, how do you deal with somebody whose work style may not match with you? Maybe just the polar opposite of you. And then the other question is, how, what's the C who does the CFO report to and how does that conversation go? Usually. Right. So, you know, I think it's, there's different ways of not matching with my style, right? I think that you can really be, I mean, everybody has different personalities. So I think it's just, you know, being, using your relationship and people skills to acclimate or to get along or to, like I said, again, stay open to another person's process because it might be different from yours, but that doesn't mean it's, doesn't get to the same result or something, as long as it's not like an, not hurtful or harmful and also not creating huge inefficiencies or creating an environment that's not a best practice environment where, you know, it's not really healthy for people to create their own spreadsheets that nobody else knows how to do and things of that nature. You really try to create environments where, if God forbid something happened to somebody and they couldn't come to work, we could bring in somebody else and they would be able to acclimate pretty quickly because we are putting in processes and procedures that are supported by the systems, you know, the software systems we have in place and, and our best practices that are practiced throughout the industry. Right. Sorry, my refrigerator just started off loudly. And it yeah, came. no problem. <laughs> I understand. And then the second question, who do I report to? Usually I report to the founder. Okay. And does the founder, like, are they all the same? Are they talking the same story? Or like? Oh, no. I mean, I think, like I said, people are people and everybody has different personalities. I think it's super important to understand who you're reporting to, what their objectives are, what their priorities are, uh, because then you can deliver, you know, what they, what they need, but no, they don't, they're not all the same. They're, they're all very different in fact, but I've worked for some amazing founders and, and they can be very inspirational. Wow. Could you share a success story? Of a, a founder success story? Founder, any yeah, a success story. It seems like you have plenty. Yeah, I, I'm gonna share. I'll share a success story. It's not about a founder, but I think it's a, it's a great story, and there was a lot of lessons in that in the in the story. So when I was working for one of the companies, I they had a wholesale and a retail business, mm -hmm. and the corporate office was mostly focused on the wholesale business because their financing was dependent on the wholesale business, and that was just where their bigger branding was occurring. But the retail business was quite, had a fairly large presence. And, you know, they had their own sales objectives and their own sales goals. And when they would do their buying, at the, you know, before a season, they would order, you know, for production, their inventory to meet their sales objectives. And what kept happening was that the wholesale division kept taking their inventory to meet their sales objectives, or they had a sales opportunity and so they would, without consulting with the retail division, take the inventory. And then the, the retail division didn't have inventory to fill the stores properly. And so what I did was create a separate warehouse, physical warehouse. So they had a really big warehouse. I was able to find a separate room in their warehouse where we could um physically separate our inventory from theirs 
And we also implemented a new warehouse software system. So they didn't even have visibility of our inventory anymore. Once we received it from them. So like we went, once we received in the inventory, we would buy it from the wholesale division. After that, they could not have access to it either physically or um, through the software. So that was a really great solution to that problem. Very smart. Yeah. Diplomatic yet smart. Yeah. Do you mind sharing something about like your other part of you? Like, you know, the other things that you do outside of work? Yeah. yeah I don't mind. I'm a mother of two. I have a freshman at Berkeley and a 10th grader. And so they keep me, you know, focused and grounded and current <laughs> and busy. And then, you know, I have great friends. My whole family lives here still. I have a very small family, actually, but they all live here. My sister lives here with her family. My parents are still here. And so I do spend time with them. And I have great friends who I'm very fortunate to have. And I have a morning routine that I'm really committed to. And so I usually start my day with my morning routine, go transition into work. And then if my daughter is with me, I, you know, try to be present for her when she comes home for school. And, and if she's not, usually I very mellow in the afternoons towards the end of the day, you know, it's, it's usually a long day and I'm pretty tired. So I try to just recharge for the next day. But I love, I just bought a new hydro. So I'm really, in, I don't know what you know, if you know what that is, it's a rowing machine. So I'm really enjoying learning how to row. And it, it's actually a really cool community of people. And I think it's kind of like a Peloton environment, you know, a little cool fish, but it's fun. Cool, awesome. And uh, that's great. Do you also do work with charities and other yeah you want to yeah so usually it's a passion of mine to I usually have like one nonprofit at least in my in my portfolio and currently I have one called hope for Ukraine who's doing amazing amazing work for you know the families in Ukraine we have a lot of operations on the ground in Ukraine for the children they're providing you know Christmas activities summer camp activities tutoring for them we have refugees here in America that we're supporting. We have some medical support that we're offering. Patients will fly them here for the proper medical attention that they need. And it's a huge passion of mine. My grandparents were Holocaust survivors. So when the war broke out in Ukraine, it really reminded me of their experience. And I was really close to my heart. And then I was able to get this opportunity to be a part of this organization. So I'm a fractional CFO for them as well. Uh, or what does a fractional CFO does for a charity organization like that? So the same thing it would do for a for-profit. I mean, once you hit a certain donation amount, you have to, you're required to get audited. So mm -hmm. we really had to set up processes and procedures to ensure like they could have a successful audit every year. And just helping them with donation strategy. I, I have worked at numerous nonprofits in, in the past. The Painted Turtle, which is part of Paul Newman's Hole in the Wall camps. I've worked at, I've had the Silver Lake Jewish Community Center be a client of mine. So I have had nonprofit exposure in the past that I was able to, I'm able to bring to the table. And as part of networking group provisors that we're both a part of, I'm part of the uh, nonprofit affinity group too. So I can stay connected to what's happening in the nonprofit world through that channel. You know, just so you know, I also run a nonprofit business. Not in Oh, I did not know that. It's not intentional. Mm. It's just not making any profit. So it's become a nonprofit. Oh. <laughs> so that's a little different. Okay. <laughs> cool. Do you have any personal or business cybersecurity concerns? You know, it's just getting crazy out there, right? They're getting more and more sophisticated. I just had an experience a couple, like a week or so ago where I received an email requesting for a wire transfer from what looked completely real. I'm sure that it, someone hacked an email, a previous email, and basically copied and pasted it. And I, I it looked completely legitimate. I'm pretty good at like thinking something's fishy and I'll email like our IT department or what have you at my client to confirm, I'm always trying to be a little bit safe, you know, on the conservative side, 
but it was totally fraudulent. And so as a result, from that experience, we implemented like for every wire or electronic transfer that request that we receive via email, we have to always verbally confirm to. And I sometimes even get texts on my phone with from people that are pretending to be people I'm associated with business wise, like maybe a you know maybe one of the founders or or what have you, and they'll make up some excuse about why they're not texting from their normal phone. And I'll always have to text. Well, now I usually know, so I don't. But it was pretty scary the, and, and jarring the first time it happened. And so, you know, just really being on alert and like you could just never be too cautious. And I ended up talking to our bank and they, you know, and they gave some really good tips about about just internal control procedures we could put in place, you know, just taking that extra step. It's so hard because, again, everybody's in a hurry. We ha all have a lot of work to do. but those things are really hard to rewind, you know, if you go down that path. So it's just really scary just how sophisticated they're getting. Yeah, we see that a lot in our work tool where a vendor's email system gets hacked. And so they are communicating. The client doesn't know that it's a hacker that's communicating. So Right, to change the payment, inf the ACH information or something of that nature. They... Yeah, but they, you know, the way these people operate, and sometimes we run those exercises for our clients, it's like, it's called pretexting. So we build a trust. We have conversation for, you know, that's what hackers do, like a month, two months. And yeah. Slowly, then they'll say, oh, by the way, slight change. By that time, you already, you know, know like that person. Right. So it's really figuring out ways to objective, like confirm that that request in it you know with objectivity right. so yeah so it's yeah it's scary yeah also like if it's because of a vendor's security labs like we should have contracts in place that they are responsible for their security and if we happen to make payment like we these are real situations where mm -hmm. payment was sent and the vendor said you paid the wrong person pay me again so then the client loses money twice right so having those contracts in place are really useful right sometimes that can be tricky i mean insurance i mean as you know i'm sure cybersecurity insurance has become you know i think the first time i heard about it was maybe 10 years ago right and and it was like they had to convince you <laughs> and now it's like you you gotta have you know it's not it's just part of it part of doing business so right. it's, it's really developed over the past, you know, 10 years. Yeah. A lot of claims are getting denied, though. Almost 25% oh. of claims are getting denied because it's like people are checking the checkbox, but they're not really having those controls in place sometimes. Mm, so important. Yeah. Really important. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Carrie. Any uh, Okay. Thank you. Thanks thank for you. having me. It's good to see you. Good to see you, Carrie, and keep up the great work. The world Thanks. is better. <laughs> All right. I'll take take care. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye.